We're in space and we're talking about a really weird object in the solar system. There are a lot of weird objects in the solar system, but this one caught my eye, partly because it feels like these videos bleed into every aspect of my life. I come across ideas for videos uh, doing very unexpected things. And this one was inspired by a book. So I've been reading a book called Another Year of Wonder by the broadcaster and musician Clemency Burton Hill, in which Every day there's a little entry where she describes a piece of music and you can explore a little bit about the history and the meaning of the music and listen to it and then go about your day. And so a little while ago, on the 4th of January, uh, the entry for that day was actually a piece of music that was inspired by astronomy. So that caught my attention and I listened to the music and I read about the object and I got so intrigued about this interesting object that I thought, well, just got to make a video about it. <laughs> so here we are. The object is the asteroid 4179 Tutatis. How do you write a piece of music about an asteroid? Well, of course, you know, in there's lots of music that's inspired by the, the natural world and including astronomy. So the probably the most famous uh, bit of music uh, inspired by astronomy is uh, Holst's The Planets. And even if you don't think you know this piece, I'm sure that you've probably heard bits and pieces of it because it is just so iconic and so familiar. But this piece about the asteroid is by a Finnish composer, Kaya Saira... You're going to put this in, aren't you? <laughs> it's written on the screen. Kaya Sario. <laughs> and it was actually commissioned by the um, Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra to go along with the, 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 the planets um, by uh, Sir Simon Rattle, the conductor. And so this is a very modern piece of music. It has to be modern because this asteroid was only discovered in 1989. So it's quite a recent discovery. Um, and it's interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a very close neighbor, somewhat uncomfortably close actually, because it's a near Earth asteroid. Its orbit, as it goes around the sun, takes it very close to the orbit of Earth, all the way out to near Jupiter, so crossing the orbit of Mars. So it's in this funny resonance between Jupiter and the Earth and the sun. So its orbit is set up so that every one time it goes around the sun, we go around four times. But it also comes very close to the Earth. So since it was discovered in 1989, it's made multiple close passages. So in 2004, it came within four lunar distances of the Earth. So you think about how close the moon is, it's not really close, but you know, in solar system distances, this is close. And it was only four times further away. So I'll say at this point, it's okay. We don't have to be worried about this thing. We've got a good eye on it and we know pretty much uh, what its orbit is and there is essentially zero chance uh, that it's going to collide with Earth. So like many asteroids, it is a rocky body and it's not necessarily a regular rocky body. So the advantage of it coming close is that we can actually observe it and we can even send things out to have a look. And so there are a number of asteroids and solar system bodies that we've actually sent satellites out to go and look at, sometimes even land. And so this one, it wasn't a targeted mission, but in 2012, the Chinese spacecraft uh, Chang'e, which was a lunar probe, did a very close flyby uh, from about three and a bit kilometers above the surface and confirmed that it was this lumpy, rocky body that was full of craters and a great big basin and had this very irregular structure. The asteroid is named after a Celtic god called Tutatis. This really bugged me when I first read this because I thought, that sounds really familiar. Something about that sounds really familiar, but I'm not up on Celtic gods. And I read a little bit more about it and said it's also worshipped by the Gauls. And I thought, oh yeah, that brings back something from my childhood. So Brady, I don't know if you were a reader of Asterix or were you a Tintin kind of person? I wasn't either, I'm ashamed to say. Okay, mm. so I was in, in Asterix. So I pulled this one off the shelf and sure enough, 
on the first page, we've got a phrase that reappears over and over again in these books. Yeah. Oh, by two Tartus. Yeah, so just an oath. And that's, that's where it had embedded in my head. So that's, that's the, the, the connection I made. So I got off topic because I was saying that we have learned about this asteroid in a number of ways. Um, one, by observing it from the ground. And we can do this unusually, not just by collecting photons that bounce off it, which is what we normally do as astronomers, but this was close enough that we could use radar. So the NASA Goldstone facility located in California, a big 70 meter radio dish, actually pinged radio waves off this object and got them back and was able to make um, a sort of a little video which we can show you about what it looked like. This is probably a contact binary. So probably two bodies that were pulled together by gravity, but are not really a big solid body and gravity hasn't smooshed them together into a nice spherical shape. I meant to bring in a sweet potato as an example because that's the thing it most looks like in the images and I forgot, but I cobbled together a, 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 a an object from whatever I had in my office, which were two horse chestnuts stuck together um, by blue tack. But I think this kind of demonstrates, you can compare it to the image, that it's, it's a very elongated bit. Uh, it's a very elongated object, and it's got kind of two distinct lobes to it. And it really does look like two things that were kind of stuck together. So the object itself is about four, uh, close to five kilometers along this axis, and then about two in the other axis. So it's big enough that you really wouldn't want it to hit. Uh, it would do a lot of damage if it hit the Earth. But I found an interesting size comparison where you can see where it fits with respect to some of the other objects that we've kind of visited. So it's about the same size as the nucleus of Halley's Comet, it's a bit bigger than 67P, which was another comet that we spent quite a long time around, but it's a lot smaller than some of the other big um, objects out there. Going back to the music and going back to the thing that got me interested about this object from the description in the book was this note about its rotation. So they, they noted, both the composer and the original discoverers noted that it has kind of two different kinds of rotation. So it rotates along its, its long axis uh, with a period of about five days, but that axis itself precesses, so moves around. It's pointing at different parts of the sky with a regular period of about seven days. And what I like about the, the, the music and the composer is that they acknowledge that if you are standing on that asteroid, you are not going to experience the same thing that we do here on Earth, which is to see the regular rotation of the sky and the sun. The sun is never gonna rise in the same place or set in the same place. You're just kind of randomly tumbling through space. And I think that's kind of, I don't know, makes you, makes you think about how the universe is, the perspective on the universe is quite different depending on where you're living in it. Professor, you're a galactic astronomer. You love galaxies and stuff that's really, really far away. Mm -hmm. Do asteroids get your juices flowing or do you look at them and think, ah, this is just gravel. I want, I, I want the big stuff. It's kind of both. So it's different parts of your brain, right? So the original part of my brain that just liked space stuff and just says wow to a, a wide variety of things, says isn't that amazing that this thing, we, we can find out that this thing is in our neighborhood, we can track it, we can learn about it, and we can try to understand how it tells us about how the solar system and indeed the Earth formed. Yeah? The uh, extragalactic astronomer in me says oh, this thing's just a piece of rock and it's getting in my way, <laughs> uh, you know, because asteroids sometimes do come across our, our field of view and, and sort of mess up our observations. So I can hold both thoughts in my head at the same time. When you do some of your work and you do these like huge surveys and you're looking at a picture of the sky, like the picture behind you, with all those galaxies, with billions of stars, and I can't imagine how many planets, do you ever stop and think, there are asteroids in there too? There are little asteroids floating around, little, or, or is that just not even entering your mind? Yeah, well Brady, I will refer you back to the video that we made about that picture many years ago, um, in which I talked about how, in that case, an asteroid did 
track across the field of view. And I got very excited about this weird thing that was showing up and I excitedly went to one of my colleagues and said, oh my goodness, what is this? And they said, uh, it's an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, you, you can you can have the connection between the two for sure. But you don't think about the asteroids in the galaxies, like in the galaxies. No, no, um, that that yeah. I might think about planets. I might think about individual stars. If I think really hard, I might think about planets. But no, I don't think I I go down to that. I haven't until now, and now I am thinking about those individual. <laughs> but like we've managed to talk for like ten minutes about yeah. this asteroid. Yeah. And there's all those asteroids in those galaxies. And imagine how many stories there are and how many interesting objects there are and collisions. And it's... We're going to be making videos for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to run out of things to talk about. But yeah, that's what astronomy gives you. It gives you this crazy sense of perspective of both being incredibly tiny in the universe, but also that there is so much out there, um, which is uniquely interesting. the two things out. They also found that there was a difference in how many heavy elements the stars had in each of these clusters. So we're talking things like, yeah, okay, fine, helium, but also mostly things like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and obviously some of the traditionally more heavier metals up to iron as well. So the way that we find out if stars contain those elements is we take a spectrum of the light from the star.